please remain standing if you're able, and I would like to ask Brother Jimmy Martin to come and lead us in prayer. We could bow our heads. Father, in the, <laughs> in the mightiest name that I know, the most powerful name, Lord God, that has been demonstrated to me in my life, the proven promiser and the keeper of truth and life, that name that abounds throughout all heaven and all earth, Lord God, the name that which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, Father, that you are Lord, that name, Jesus, we come before and we ask, faith believing, nothing wavering, for you, Lord God, to come and have an encounter with us here and now. Father, Lord Jesus, we, we invite your presence, Lord God. We, we, we confess that we're sinners. We confess that we need a Savior. We confess that we need more of you in our life, Lord God. So right here and now, Father, we surrender, God. We lift up our hand and we surrender, Lord God, knowing that when we surrender to you, Father, Lord God, we are victorious in this life. Knowing that when we surrender and we uphold your mighty hand, that you give us all all the ability to conquer, and that greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world, and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So, Father, this morning, Lord God, as your servant is prepared to, to, stem, to, to share your word of God, he doesn't come with enticing words of man wisdoms, but he comes in the power and the demonstration of your spirit, Father, Bless Jesse, Lord God, with a coal from your altar. Father, in Jesus' name, let him receive that upon his mouth, Lord God. Give him your heart to speak, God. Give him your direction to see. Give, let him feel the affirmities of this congregation that we can come out of this place, Father, changed and made whole, knowing that we have been with you, Lord Jesus. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. So I've um, kept to my plan. I've lost 10 pounds by proper eating and getting rid of some things in my diet. So if you happen to find those 10 pounds, keep them. I don't want them. I don't need them back. <laughs> Someone found them? Okay, you can keep them. So our vision here in Lindenhurst for the year is first love, then learn, part of what we're doing today, grow, like Brother Jimmy sh shared, we're changing as we're learning because we're growing. We're not the same person when we leave here as when we came because we're changed. Share what we did, our Hope Talk series. Thank you, Brother Shaq, for we're gonna start that back up again in the spring. Because once we have something we grow, we have to share it. Can't keep it. Love again. Isn't that interesting? It starts with love and ends with love. Because if we go out and share with a bunch of people and we don't love them, what good is it? We can fill this place up and have no love. So we got to love again. I need love again. You know, it was the fear of God that called me, but it was the love of God that kept me theme for this month comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them to curse you. By the way, this is Jesus speaking, it's not just some ordinary prophet. Bless them to curse you and do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. And make it this sun to rise on the evil and the good and send it rain on the just and the unjust. We're going to talk a little bit more about that rain later too. Today's verse comes from John chapter 15. Jesus again speaking. He says, no greater love hath no man than this. This is Jesus as he's getting close to the end of his journey. He knows he's going to die. So he's speaking what's going to happen in his life. No greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's where he was with. He was with his friends, those closest to him. He's telling them he's going to die. He's leading by example. He's setting the bar pretty high. 
you know. We love each other as long as it's good for us, right? As long as I get something out of the deal. But when the times are hard, do I still love the person I'm supposed to love? Hmm. Amen. Pastor Lee is doing well. He's down in Norfolk. He's probably done preaching by now. But we, we always mean to call each other before I have a sermon. For a few minutes, we end up talking for about an hour, praying and talking and laughing and crying. And Man, I, I tell you what, if you can get on that app or get online today, Facebook, and catch that sermon, whew, the Holy Ghost was on fire today. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, they gave him some liberty down there. Well, the Holy Ghost gave him some liberty. But catch that, catch that message. He's doing fine. He greets you all in Jesus' name. He'll be back soon. No, no Greater Love is our title today. No Greater Love. We're going to talk about three things mainly. No Greater Love, the part, first part of it. Second part is going to be love God and love others, something that Pastor Andy talked about. I'm going to go over some of those things that he talked about last week. Part three, make it rain, Lord. Make it rain. Part one, no greater love. Jesus really set the bar high on that one, didn't he? It's kind of like, whew. Is he expecting us to go out and just die for one another? Literally die for one another? If, if need be, yeah. Paul said Priscilla and Aquila laid their necks on the line for him, for the gospel. They were with him from the beginning when he started his ministry, building tents and a business together just to get enough money to get the ministry off the ground. But they went further than just helping him get the ministry off the ground. They put their necks on the line for him when he was in trouble numerous times. But Jesus loved by example, even to the death of the cross. No greater love. When I was growing up, I would get clothes handed down from older siblings. Sometimes you were the, user, the third person getting those clothes. And they were fairly worn. Called them hand-me-downs or diminished clothes, second-hand clothes. God doesn't give us a diminished love, a second-hand love. We didn't get a love from somebody else who got it from somebody else who got it from somebody else, and here we are today. We got a love that's real and alive, and it's for each and every one of us. doesn't matter your age. doesn't matter how long you've been around. It's there and available. John chapter 3, verses 16, starting verse 16. Here's Jesus talking to a ruler of the Jews who should know these things. He already mentioned to him, you've got to be born again. But now he's going to tell him about this love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is said so many times it's almost cliche. People just kind of pass over it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent it, not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We well, you know what that name is? Jesus, right? Right? You've got to start with believing in the name. And this is the condemnation that men, that light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because the deeds were evil. There's a common saying that people say to believe that children are born good. No, we're kind of really born into an evil world. David said, from my womb, I was born in sin. I was born evil. By nature, we're not good. So we love darkness rather than light. So what does God do? He sends his only son, comes down in flesh, and says, I'm going to give you a greater love. I love you this much that I'm going to die for you. Because you don't have to be in that darkness. You don't have to stay there. He gave us his best. And if you have a, a child, would you will willingly give them up for the rest of the world so that they could be saved? That's a deep love, isn't it? So we sort of wear those clothes to become comfortable in them, those secondhand clothes. Those worn, diminished clothes. And all along, God's got a better love, a higher love, a greater love. We like those filthy rags. We got the hole in the knee. 
not talking about how you're dressed. I'm talking about spiritual here. You see, God loves you, and his love never fades. Never grows old, and it never stops giving. That blood never loses its power. Where were you at when you met the blood? Can you remember back? I was a young sailor in the Navy, just like those folks who are here today from the base. Just about going about doing my business. Got called to the Gulf War on a ship. Back then, you get called and we just got back from another cruise. It's time to go in a week. We're going to go back out. The president gave us orders. We're going to war. And I was part of what's called a repair locker, and I would talk on the phone, and during our downtime, I would say a joke, and everybody would laugh. I thought it was quite funny, except one guy. He was a Christian. He didn't preach to me, he didn't teach me anything, he just didn't laugh. I told him years later, said, after I became a Christian, I said, was I funny at all? He said, I was biting the inside of my cheek not to laugh. But he had a testimony to maintain because he didn't want the darkness to be his love. He wanted the love of God, a greater love, to be a love. He wanted to be a testimony from everybody. So this testimony stayed. I didn't go to church at that time. I wasn't ready. I wasn't called. I wasn't prepared. 19 years old. I didn't know. But I had to go through some more things and wait for God's timing in my life to call me. But it doesn't matter how old you are to be called. You can be eight years old and be called of God. So that testimony was the love of God, the first time that light really shined into my life. Years later, I was on the base and kind of down, beaten down by life, downtrodden, kind of feeling like there was no hope. And I started seeking God. I started crying out to God, if you're real, send someone to show me. And there was this guy across the hall. He was not the brightest guy in the world, but. He was playing this gospel music, and someone kind of just nudged me into, my, into his room. There was nobody else around. But did you ever get a nudge, and you felt like you just kind of stumbled in there? Hey, uh, hi, uh, I like the music you're playing. I started asking him questions. I said, so what, uh, do you know about God? Because he had a Bible open, I noticed, on the bed there. And he started flipping the scriptures. I asked more questions. He flipped to the scripture. And pointing to scripture, the answer that I was looking for. This wasn't the smartest guy, but he loved God. And he was letting his light shine. I said, well, uh, you know, he said, all right, let's go out to Bible study tonight. We have a worship service tonight. Come on out. It's Wednesday night. Got nothing else going. Oh, I got to do my laundry. How many have heard that excuse before? I got to do my laundry. <laughs> but he said, oh, we got some laundry. We got a laundry mat right around the corner. We can throw it in and go to worship. I said, well, I got a vacuum of floor. I can't take that with, too. But as I was walking out of his room, a videotape played in my mind of that other brother back in the ship going into his room. And I came back and I said, do you know this particular person? He said, yes, give me five minutes. I'm going from that time six years ago to that moment now, God showed me this is where he wanted me to be, from that testimony. So you don't, don't underestimate the power of your testimony. No greater love. There was an old song actually by a man who used to be a Pentecostal worship leader, a preacher. Meatloaf was the name of the band. But he said, that I would, the song was, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. And if you really go look in the lyrics of that song, what it was, his girlfriend had cheated on him. And he said he won't forgive her for that. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. He'd forgotten what he, would call, he was called to originally, a greater love. And sometimes in life, we've had people hurt us and wound us and we feel that we cannot forgive that pain. But God in us can. Is the love of God in you? Right, Pastor Andy, you talked about that last week. Is the love of God in you enough? Yes, it's not diminished. To show mercy. To love that person. He's not only said he won't do that, he can't do that. Can you do that? Can you love enough? God did that and more. We place limits on our love boundaries that if someone steps across that, that's the end of our love for them. I'm not talking about a trust thing here. There's sometimes you've got to stop trusting someone when they've broken that trust. Okay? I mean, you're not going to go, keep going back to the same person that's broken that trust over and over and over again. 
You're going to love them and show them mercy, but that trust is, that's got to be built again. That's over. You got to give it time. You, be, you, you demand mercy and forgiveness and you want that trust to be right back there? You broke it. But God can even repair that. I've seen him do it. So who's our enemies? Brother Chris talked about the wicked. Yeah, Satan's the main one, but the wicked in the world. I was my own worst enemy. I was the one that would always take myself back to the wrong places. I was my own worst person to love. Yeah, if I could find it easy to love God, I could find it easy to love my brothers and sisters, but I couldn't love myself. And that's a hard place to be. Because you've got to love yourself before you can love your neighbor. You've got to love the God in you. You've got to love the God that's restoring you. You've got to love the God that's trying to help you. Because our Father which is in heaven, that's how we're known of him. Pastor Orlop talked about by that correction, by that, you know, we're not bastards because we allow God to love us and correct us and get us back on the right path. So when God would correct me, I would just stay and stay down. I couldn't pull myself back up sometimes. Maybe you're at there today. Maybe you're at that place in life where you just feel like you're so beaten down that there's no hope. But God's there. He's there to reach down and pull you back up, as someone mentioned this morning. So in losing these pounds, sometimes I'll drive by the golden arches <laughs> and I'll make a mistake and I'll eat a greasy cheeseburger and some fries, maybe extra large fries. But do I stay in that binge? Or do I go back to the plan and say, I don't need to do this anymore? Now, sometimes I could even go with a brother who likes that greasy stuff, and I'm looking at them fries, and I'm like, can I have a few, and I can't stop. <laughs> we got people pointing at each other in the audience here. <laughs> Pray for them, brothers. <laughs> but you know, I'm on a path. I've decided, I've chosen that I want to eat differently. I want to live differently. So after, I, after a while, repetitively doing that, they say a habit is developed in how many days? 21 days. Now I can drive by the marches and go, hmm, I don't need, I could even, if my daughter wants some nuggets, I'll buy her some nuggets from there and I won't even order nothing from the menu. Although I'm trying to get her the family up that stuff too. <laughs> it's junk. I'm my own worst enemy sometimes. Same as with God love. Everything else doesn't appeal to me anymore. That darkness doesn't appeal to me anymore. I can drive by something that used to kind of like get my attention. Maybe that pretty girl walked by and all of a sudden I'm just find myself staring at her longer than I should. Now I look at her as that could be a sister. That's another soul that just walked by. That's someone who needs the love of God. No greater love. So instead of looking at things selfishly myself, I start to look at things like, how can I help that person? How can I reach out to that person? Not look at them like they're the devil. Bring a bunch of holy water on me and throw it on them. God's love is always fresh and never diminished. I make a choice to love now. I make a choice to love the right way. I make a choice to love the way God would have me to love. Part two, love God and love others. Pastor Gieber really shared this story. I'm going to go into a little more depth about the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this wasn't a question like someone who was seeking. This was somebody from the get-go, he was tempting him. And he was a lawyer, so he knew the law. You ever come across a lawyer who tried to trap you in questions? That's their job to do that. This is his, this is his life. He's, he's, he's trying to trap Jesus. He's trying to tempt him. Get him to say something that he shouldn't say. And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Because he knows he's the lawyer. So he's throwing it back on him. 
That's a good tactic in sales, by the way. Answer a question with a question. Jesus was a master at this. <laughs> they would ask him a question. Well, I'll tell you the answer to that if you tell me the answer to this. So he did. So what does it say in the law? You're a lawyer. Go ahead, speak. And he answered saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. Do this and thou shalt live. But this guy wasn't done. Oh, he just had to take it further. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, This is the Son of God. Maybe he doesn't know that, but this is the Son of God he's talking to here. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, said, A certain man, and he went into a parable. Jesus talked to the people that were around him, or the masses, in parables. Why? Because seeing they cannot see, and hearing they cannot perceive. So he gave it to them in parables. So he's going to give them a story, a parable. That's all it is. When you're telling someone a story about your life or what happened, kind of trying to relate to them, you're telling them a parable. A certain man went down to Jerusalem, to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and he saw him pass by on the other side. Why did he pass by on the other side? He was a priest. He was important. He had things to do. He can't touch someone who's bleeding. He's half dead. You've got to stay around it. Avoid it. Likewise, a Levite. And when he was at the place, he came and looked on him. Oh, yeah, he's in pretty rough shape. And passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, now this is the enemy loving others. Kind of the role reversed. An enemy, they're half Jews. Kind of like a half breed. They kind of like didn't get along too well. As he journeyed, came where he was. Now he, you don't think he had something to do? He wasn't had important places to go and things to do? And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Met him where he's at, bound up his wounds, put in the stuff to help heal him, and took him to church. What's a church? It's a hospital for wounded people, for sick people like me. But if you're not out there and you don't pay attention to people where they're at and meet them where they're at, you're not going to see that they're wounded or they're hurt, they're broken, they're bleeding, they're half dead because you're so busy being religious or what you've got to do. You're going to pass right on by or avoid them. You might even notice it. But how can the love of God dwell in you if you don't stop and take time to listen to them, meet their needs where they're at? Sometimes we're so quick to share what we think people should hear. We don't really even take time to listen to them. Where are you at? What caused this pain? Well, I got fell among thieves and they robbed me and left me half dead. Let me help you. Let me take you to a place where you can be healed. Let me take you to a place where you can be whole. And on the morrow when he de departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. Gave him to the pastor. Take care of him. Gave him to the elder. Gave him to someone who's faithful. Watch over him. And said, take care of him. Whatsoever he, sp he spend more, I will come again and I will repay thee. So it wasn't the end of it right there. Don't stop just because you run out of money. I'm going to come back and, and settle this up. Because there might be some more needs he needs a little later on. And that two pence might not be enough. But I got to go take care of my business. I'm going to have some more cash when I come back by, and I'll finish up the debt. Which of these, this is Jesus asking again, thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Go and do thou likewise. Go and show mercy. Go and share with others the love that you have.
And do it with your actions. First John chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath he murdered eternal life, abiding in him. Hereby we perceive the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So what does it mean to lay down your life? Maybe just go sit and have a cup of coffee with them. You're busy. Yeah, we're all busy. Maybe take a day of vacation day and just drive them over to get to pick up their needs. Maybe they need some clothes. Maybe they need some Maybe they're having a rough spot and they just need some food. Go buy some groceries for them. And that's what I like about small groups, and Sister Abby was talking about this, how in small groups we're really finding a way to connect with our brothers and sisters. And then through that, God's going to show you one another's needs. And you're going to be able to help meet those needs. So don't just brush off that if the, one of the leaders starts to call you and wants to get together for small groups. Don't just brush that out. Don't dismiss that. That's how we're really going to meet each other's needs. We can't do it all Sunday. And you can't expect the four elders to do it all. They're not like those wrestlers, the four horsemen. They can't just get up and do everything all the time. <laughs> Little wrestling joke for wrestling fans. But it's true. Yeah, they, they're on call. They don't shut their phones off. They'll get up and pray with you. Sometimes they'll go visit you. Pastor Elise was talking about, when I became a pastor, I never shut my phone off. And when I became more international, I put it on silent, but I never shut it off. There's this, the wolf comes at night. He's not coming when you're wide awake during the day. So you're not a hireling, he said. You're not fleeing when the sheep are in trouble. You're going to meet that need or sending somebody to go meet that need. So are you a hireling or a shepherd? Jesus is a shepherd. He, gave down his he laid down his life for the sheep. That's a hard pill to swallow. I didn't sign up for that. Nobody signed up for anything. God did it all. We're just saying, God, how can I love the way you love? How can I share with the people that, how can I meet their needs? How can I go visit them in the hospital? How can I pray, for them, pray with them over the phone? Okay, I bought that. This is how we really know we're his children. Hate is in a place of death. That's what it says here. If you love, if you don't love your brother, if you hate your brother, it's like being dead. That's not a good place to be. You're cold, you're dead, you're just, you can't even do anything with you. We're not dead. We're alive. And we have that love. We can commit spiritual murder with the very words we say. The power of life and death is in the tongue. You know that you can speak life into somebody else's hope and dreams and aspirations, especially young people. How do you treat them? How do you speak to them? Do you give them hope when you spend time with them? Or do you just want to give them a Bible study and they're going to learn what I know? Or you're going to love them. And they're going to see that example and say, I want what you got. And I want to go share with my friends who are broken and hurt and lost. That kind of love. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 19 to 21. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. Their contentions are like bars of a castle. A man's belly should be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. With the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Life, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So if you want life and you want to speak that love into people and you want to get that love back, that's how you do it. You speak it. You live it. How quickly we judge others. I did that this week. I had a conversation with one of my nieces that's been seeking God for a long time and I got a little overzealous in the conference. She wasn't ready to hear it. And she, it, she took it from the place of where Uncle Jesse had a moment to share with her to where I was judging her in a moment. And at that point, there's nothing I could do except give it to God because I judged her. 
Uh, my intentions were right. My heart was right, but I judged her. Can God repair that? I went and apologized the next day, and she hugged me, and she said, it's okay, Uncle. When I'm ready, I know who I can go talk to. We've got to be careful what we say. We've got to be careful what we do. We can destroy years of time and ministry we put into somebody in just in a moment because we've got our rules of what we think is right. Yeah, there's a time for all that. And there's a time for correction, but there's also a time for a little more patience. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, discretion of a man defers his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. One person that I really respect for that was Pastor Wilson. Sometimes I'd be in his office, and I would get so mad, I'd throw down my books and said, I quit! And he was like, whoa, sit back down, brother. Because <laughs> I was a treasurer at the time, and it was, it was not an easy time to be a treasurer. We were cutting the lights off in the building, turning the heat off. Couldn't meet the bills. You remember that? I quit, I said. I said, but down, bro. Calm down. Instead of throwing me out on my, my tail. Let's pray about it. Let's find a way to work together to see how we can meet, meet the needs of the church. And we did. And I stayed. Thank you, I did. So in a moment, we can destroy years of work in someone's life. In a moment of hot passion, anger. I get angry. Well, I gave him a piece of my mind. You just lost a piece of your heart, though. And you can't get that back. Not easily. When you offend somebody. Is it sinking in a little bit? It sank in for me a little bit. I'm not immune to that. I just told you I offended my niece, who I've been sharing with for about six years. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalt the folly. And James says it this way in James chapter 1, 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Sometimes it's the other way around. We're slow to hear, quick to speak, and quick to wrath. Hmm. How do you deal with people with difficult situations then? How do you deal with difficult people? I'm one of the difficult, Pastor Orlop could tell you, I think we butt heads more than anybody in, as far as the elders. But yet he loves me. He takes time to sit down with me and let's work this out together, brother. Many a times he could have said, I'm not going to deal with Jesse no more. He's a knucklehead. But some of us that are, that are high, strong, or high performers are like that. You've got to get used to dealing with people like us like that. Because we want to do something. It's not that we're so angry with you. We're just angry at the pace of things. And really, we just need to have a little more patience. That's what we really need. A little more patience, a little more understanding, a little more time. If you need to give correction or a rebuke, make sure the source is love. The source is not out of your hot temper or out of your anger. Amen? Do we need to keep going a little further into that? Or everybody got the point? I think we got the point. Okay. All right. Abraham Lincoln would often write a scathing letter of rebuke to someone. Then he would pause before sending it and file it in a drawer. Then the next day, he would take it out and look at it and go, no, I'm not going to send this. This guy has value. Put it back in that drawer. And often, even after his death, there was a stack of letters in his drawer that were never sent. Because he knew sometimes if he made that decision in his anger, in his frustration, if he fired that general or got mad at that congressman, that might have been it with the, with the relationship. He'd lose the whole war. Whole Often, would we, if we just react differently, if we just paused, we're a little slower to speak, a little more slower to wrath, how many more people would be around with us today? We're just a little more patient. So what did Jesus say after the response? Go and do love likewise. Go and show mercy likewise. Part three, make it rain, Lord. Make it rain. Now Chris talked about Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, quite well, so I'm not going to go over loving your enemies so much. Let's, do, let's focus on verse number 45. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, 
who maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Everybody gets the rain. God's not a judge of person, judge of respecter of persons. You ever see in a field of grass where it only rains on one little part of it? The whole grass gets all the rain. Maybe some people are more seeking. A lot of people are asking what's happening in Ashbury, Kentucky, and all these colleges where people are starting to, young people are crying out to God. They're going to the altar, and they're staying there for days, weeping before God. And God is pouring out his rain. Zechariah chapter 10, beginning of verse 1. Ask ye of the Lord the rain and the ladder and the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. For the isles have spoken vanity, and diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain, wherefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled, because there was no shepherd. There was nobody guiding them. And that's the way it is with a lot of people. They go and seek God, but really yield themselves to a shepherd. The chief shepherd being Jesus Christ. Lord, what do you want me to do? Joel chapter 2. This is the, the prophecy. Now, if you understand and you study prophecy, written prophecy is logos. Spoken prophecy is remus. So when it's spoken, remus. God spoke. Let there be light. Let, let there be this. Let there be that. Spoke. Remus. When it's written, as it is written, what Jesus would say. As it is written. That's logos. Written prophecy. Keep that in mind as we talk about the rain and the latter rain. Be glad then, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall be overflowing with wine and oil. Remember that guy who bound up his wounds and gave him wine and oil? There's a great significance in wine and oil when it comes to healing. These people needed some healing. And I will restore, restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army, which I will send among you. And you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that have dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye should know that I am the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it will come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Who's the sons and daughters? Israel. Where were they at in Israel? What was the day? The day of a Pentecost. This is the former. This is the people that must get it first. This is the... The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. God's pouring out his spirit upon them first in the day of Pentecost. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Now, that's not the end of it. There's a second group of people. And also upon your servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. That's us. That's the Gentiles. We're going to get it after that. Because it didn't stop. It went to the house of Cornelius. It went to all these other places. Wherever the gospel was being spread. Acts chapter 2. So let's pick this up. This is Peter preaching. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It was spoken Remus, but now it's written. So it's Logos. And it shall come to pass in those last days, saith God, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And then my servants and my handmaids will also pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Prophesy and prophesy both mean the same thing in the Old Testament and New Testament in this. It means that it's through remos and through song, worship. So when you're up here leading and you're worshiping and you're singing, you're also prophesying. Because God is sending that rain out to the people, touching their hearts, so it's waters. What's the purpose of rain? If it just stayed in the clouds, it's no good. It's meant to bring the water down, water all the grass, to feed the people, to encourage the people. When you're given a testimony, 
and God puts something in your heart to share. Maybe you don't know a lot of scriptures, but you just have an encouraging word to share. Remos. And if you quote a scripture, logos, right? Remos, logos. And let's pick it up in verse 37. 36, actually. Acts chapter 2 is still in there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that that God have made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? Another question. But these people were actually looking because they realized they just crucified the Christ. And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and unto your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And when many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself. See, the Spirit of God didn't fall just to everybody to feel good. They need to do some repenting. Just like we had to do some repenting. Right? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then shall he send Jesus Christ which before preached unto you, whom heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The rain covers the entire ground. So these young people do you think it's of God? Should they be allowed to receive this rain? Yes. That's God's promise. They're seeking God. They're seeing the signs of the times. They're seeing trouble in the earth. They're seeing trouble in their schools. They're seeing trouble in their families. They're seeing trouble, and they're not getting answers sometimes in the traditional church. So they're going crying and pouring their hearts out to God, and God is sending the rain. But it's like a, a bunch of sheep without a shepherd if you don't repent. If you don't want to change the way you're living. If you don't want to go down to that watery grave back there and be born again, like he was telling Nicodemus before, he said, God loved so, so loved the world. He said, how can a man be born again? He's asking him these questions because he wants to know. He must be born of the water and the spirit to enter in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about baptism. You can't even look at it, he said. You can't even see the kingdom of heaven unless you get born again. Well, didn't I go to the altar and the rain fell on me and I felt good and I Someone led me in a prayer. You believed, but did you repent? And did you go down that water? It says, born, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness life. Well, I did it because my parents told me when I was a kid. You need to do it for you. You need to do it because your heart needs to be circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, it says. You're not sure about that? You're kind of still seeking God a little bit? Let the day to be the day you get your answers. We'll have some elders around, some teachers around. We'll take the time to sit with you and pray with you and go over the scriptures. You don't have to leave here today and not know that greater love in you. You can have that today. So God has no respect to our persons. The rain comes on the just and the unjust. It comes on the enemies. It comes on me. The difference between the just and the unjust is faith. For the just shall live by faith. And that faith leads them to repentance. So our vision for our church here in Lindenhurst as I get ready to close again is love, learn, grow, share, and love again. Thank you for your time. God bless you.